Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and I wanted to bring this to your attention. Now, I actually have known about this document since it first came out, which was back in April of 2018, but at the time I didn't have this particular channel up and running, and I don't do politics on my Garden Devotions channel, so I just shared it with people that I knew, and I downloaded a copy for myself so I could keep track of it. Well, I'd kind of forgotten about this, but in one of my previous videos, somebody left a comment, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who, but you left me a comment reminding me of this, and it's like, oh yeah, I really do need to do a video on this because this document is huge. And if you think you know stuff about Mueller, but you've not read this document, hang in there, okay? It's really important stuff. Well, you can download the report right here, but I have it open. It's a PDF, and I've got it open, and I'm going to kind of go through it, but I can't, I'm not going to go through all of it in this video because it's 48 pages long, but I'm going to break it up into segments that have to do with certain topics, and this particular topic is going to be dealing with some of the introductory things to Robert Mueller and some of the things that Louis Gomer has witnessed over the years. You know, he's been in Congress for a while, and so he's got some experience behind him. He's watched a lot of things happen. And so, you know, it's just a great document. So here we go. Okay, hang with me. We're going to do the first few pages on this one. So Robert Mueller unmasked, that's what he calls it. Robert Mueller has a long and sordid history of illicitly targeting innocent people that is a stain upon the legacy of American jurisprudence. He lacks the judgment and credibility to lead the prosecution of anyone. Now, remember, this was written by him back in April of 2018. But keep in mind everything you know now about Robert Mueller, because I think it's even more eye-opening now that we know so much. So let's go on. I do not make these statements lightly. Each time I prepared to question Mueller during congressional hearings, the more concerned I became about his work ethic. Then, as I went back to begin compiling all that information in order to recount personal interactions with Mueller, the more clearly the big picture began to come into focus. At one point, I had to make the decision to stop adding to this or it would turn into a far too lengthy project. He covers a lot of the, the highlights, though. My goal was to share some first-hand information as other Republican members of Congress had requested, adding, you seem to know so much about him. This article is prepared from my viewpoint, article, <laughs> 48 pages, uh, yeah, a long article, is prepared from my viewpoint to help better inform the reader about the special prosecutor leading the effort to railroad President Donald J. Trump through whatever manufactured charge he can allege. Judging by Mueller's history, it doesn't matter who he has to threaten, harass, prosecute, or bankrupt to get someone to be willing to allege something, anything, about our current president. It certainly appears Mueller will do what it takes to bring down its target, ethically or unethically, based on my findings. What does former Attorney General Eric Holder say? Sounds like much the same thing I just said. Holder's, and this is a quote from Holder, I've known Bob Mueller for 20, 30 years. My guess is he's just trying to make the case as good as he possibly can. <laughs> Holder does know him. He has seen Mueller at work when Holder was obstructing justice and acting in contempt of Congress. He knows Mueller's FBI framed innocent people and had no remorse in doing so. Let's look at what we know. What I have accumulated here is absolutely shocking upon the realization that Mueller's disreputable, twisted history speaks to the character of the man placed in a position to attempt to legalize a coup against a lawfully elected president. Any Republican who says anything resembling, Bob Mueller will do a good job as special counsel, Bob Mueller has a great reputation for being fair, or anything similar, a. Wants President Trump indicted for something and removed from office regardless of his innocence. B. Is intentionally ignorant of the myriad of outrageous problems permeating Mueller's professional history. 
or C is cultivating future Democrat votes when he or she comes before the Senate someday for a confirmation hearing. There is simply too much clear and convincing information available to the contrary. Where other writers have set out information succinctly, I have quoted them with proper attribution. My goal is to help you see what I have found. And he even includes pictures. Isn't that nice of him? By the way, remember, you can always speed things up. You know, there's there's a little place, If even if you're on your cell phone, if you like, sometimes it's little, three little dots and it'll allow you to speed things up. So I recommend that because you can usually listen a lot faster than I can read. So I highly recommend that on videos like this. In his early years as FBI director, most Republican members of Congress gave Mueller a pass in oversight hearings, allowing him to avoid tough questions. After all, we were continually told Bush appointed him. I gave him easy questions the first time I questioned him in 2005 out of deference to his Vietnam service. Yet the longer I was in Congress, the more conspicuous the problems became. As I have said before of another Vietnam veteran, just because someone deserves our respect for service or our sympathy for things that happened to them in the military, that does not give them the right to harm our country later. As glaring problems came to light, I toughened up my questions in the oversight hearings. But first, let's cover a little of Mueller's history. Mueller's minions help mobster Whitey Bulger eliminate mob competitors. The Boston Globe noted Robert Mueller's connections with the Whitey Bulger case in an article entitled One Lingering Question for FBI Director Robert Mueller. The Globe said this, and I really like the way he put those down there. If you get the PDF, you can click on that link and it will take you to the article. Okay. Mike Albano, former parole board member who was threatened by two FBI agents for considering parole for the men imprisoned for a crime they did not commit, was appalled that later that same year, Mueller was appointed FBI director because it was Mueller, first as an assistant U.S. attorney, then as the acting U.S. attorney in Boston, who wrote letters to the Parole and Pardons Board throughout the 1980s opposing clemency for the four men framed by FBI lies. Of course, Mueller was also in that position while Whitey Bolger was helping the FBI cart off his criminal competitors, even as he buried bodies in shallow graves along the Neponset. Mueller was the head of the criminal division as assistant U.S. attorney, then as acting U.S. attorney. I could not find any explanation online by Mueller as to why he insisted on keeping the defendants in prison that FBI agents in the pocket of Whitey Bulger had framed for a murder they did not commit. Make no mistake, these were not honorable people he had incarcerated. But it was part of a pattern that eventually became quite clear that Mueller was more concerned with convicting and putting people in jail he disliked, even if they were innocent of the charges, than he was with ferreting out the truth. I found no explanation as to why he did not bear any responsibility for the hundred million dollars paid to the defendants who were framed by the FBI agents under his control. The Boston Globe said, thanks to the FBI's corruption, taxpayers got stuck with the hundred million dollar bill for compensating the framed men, two of whom, Greco and Tomelio, died in prison. The New York Times explained the relationship this way. In the 1980s, while FBI agent Mr. McConnelly was working with Whitey Bulger, Mr. Mueller was assistant United States attorney in Boston in charge of the criminal division and for a period was the acting United States attorney there, presiding over Mr. McConnelly and Mr. Bulger as a top echelon informant. Officials of the Massachusetts State Police and the Boston Police Department had long wondered why their investigations of Mr. Bulger were always compromised before they could gather evidence against him, and they suspected that the FBI was protecting him. If Mr. Mueller had no knowledge that the FBI agents he used were engaged in criminal activity, then he certainly was so incredibly blind that he should never be allowed back into any type of criminal case supervision. He certainly helped continue to contribute to the damages of the framed individuals by working so hard to prevent them from being paroled out of prison, even as their charges were on their way to being completely thrown out. Notice also evidence of a pattern throughout this article. 
the leaking of information to disparage Mueller's targets. In the Whitey Bulger case, the leaks were to organize crime, the mob. One of the basic tenets of our democratic republic is that we never imprison people for being bad people. Anyone imprisoned has to have committed a specific crime for which they are guilty. Not in Mueller's world. He has the reverse list of Santa Claus. And if you are on his list, you get punished, even if you are framed. He never apologizes when the truth is learned, no matter how wrong or potentially criminal or malicious the prosecution was. In his book, you deserve what you get, even if you did not commit the crime for which he helped put you away. <sighs> this is one example. But as Al Pacino once famously said, I'm just getting warmed up. Does that, you know, what you've heard so far definitely sounds like what we've been through just this past week. Congressman Kurt Weldon defeated by Mueller's FBI. During my first term in Congress, 2005 to 2006, Congressman Kurt Weldon delivered some powerful and relentless allegations about the FBI having prior knowledge that 9-11 was coming. He alleged loudly and vociferously that there was documentary evidence to show that 9-11 could have been prevented and thousands of lives saved if the FBI had done their job. My recollection is that he may have even accused them of intentionally turning their heads. He held up documents at times while making these claims in speeches on the floor of the House of Representatives. I was surprised that FBI Director Mueller seemed to take those allegations without the major response that appeared to be appropriate, at least to me. It seemed he should either admit the FBI made significant mistakes or refute the allegations. Little did I know Mueller's FBI was preparing a response, but it certainly was not the kind of response that I would have expected if an honorable man had been running that once hallowed institution. And there's Kurt Weldon which we're going to talk about in a minute. <laughs> you can read two of Congressman Weldon's speeches on the House floor that are linked below. After reading the excerpts I have provided, you may get a window into the mind of the FBI director or someone under Mueller's control at the FBI. The FBI literally destroyed Congressman Weldon's public service life, which foreclosed his ability to use a national platform to expose what he believed were major problems in the FBI fostered under the Clinton administration. Here is but one such excerpt of a speech wherein he spoke of the failure of the FBI leadership, then under the direction of the Clinton administration as it ultimately came within Mueller's control right before 9-11. They failed to even accept from the military any information on the very terrorists who would later go on to commit the atrocities of 9-11, much less act on it. They gleaned this information through development of a surveillance technology in a project called Able Danger. Okay, and I'm going to play this for you. I found the clip. So here it goes. Mr. Speaker, back in 1999, when I was chair of the Defense Research Subcommittee, the Army was doing cutting-edge work on a new type of technology to allow us to understand and predict emerging transnational terrorist threats. That technology was being done at several locations, but was being led by our Special Forces Command. The work that they were doing was unprecedented. And because of what I saw there, I supported the development of a national capability of a collaborative center that the CIA would just not accept. In fact, on November the 4th of 1999, two years before 9-11, in a meeting in my office with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Director of the CIA, Deputy Director of the FBI, we presented a nine-page proposal to create a national collaborative center. When we finished the brief, the CIA said we didn't need that capability. And so before 9-11, we didn't have it. When President Bush came in after a year of research, he announced the formation of the Terrorism Threat Integration Center, exactly what I had proposed in 99. Today it is known as the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center. But Mr. Speaker, what troubles me is not the fact that we didn't take those steps. What troubles me is that I now have learned in the last four months that one of the tasks that was being done in 1999 and 2000 was a top secret program organized 
at the request of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, carried out by the General in Charge of our Special Forces Command. A very elite unit focusing on information regarding Al-Qaeda. It was a military planning effort to allow us to identify the key cells of Al-Qaeda around the world and to give the military the capability to plan actions against those cells so they could not attack us as they did in 1993 at the Trade Center, at the Kobar Towers, with the USS Cole attack and the African Embassy bombings. What I did not know, Mr. Speaker, up until June of this year was that that secret program called Able Danger actually identified the Brooklyn cell of Al-Qaeda in January and February of 2000, over one year before 9-11 ever happened. In addition, I learned that not only did we identify the Brooklyn cell of Al-Qaeda, but we identified Muhammad Atta as one of the members of that Brooklyn cell, along with three other terrorists who committed the leadership of the 9-11 attack. I've also learned, Mr. Speaker, that in September of 2000, again over one year before 9-11, that Able Danger team attempted on three separate occasions to provide information to the FBI about the Brooklyn cell of Al-Qaeda. And on three separate occasions, they were denied by lawyers in the previous administration to transfer that information. Mr. Speaker, this past Sunday, on Meet the Press, Louis Free, FBI director at the time, was interviewed by Tim Russert. The first question to Louis Free was in regard to the FBI's ability to ferret out the terrorists. Louis Free's response, which can be obtained by anyone in this country as a part of the official record, was, well, Tim, we're now finding out that a top secret program of the military called Able Danger actually identified the Brooklyn cell of Al-Qaeda and Muhammad Atta over a year before 9-11. And what Louis Free said, Mr. Speaker, is that that kind of actionable data could have allowed us to prevent the hijackings that occurred on September the 11th. So now we know, Mr. Speaker, that military intelligence officers working in a program authorized by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the General in Charge of Special Forces Command, identified Muhammad Atta and three terrorists a year before 9-11, tried to transfer that information to the FBI, were denied, and the FBI director has now said publicly, if he'd have had that information, the FBI could have used it to perhaps prevent the hijackings that struck the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the plane that landed in Pennsylvania, and perhaps saved 3,000 lives, and changed the course of world history. Now, he only gave the link to the PDF that has the congressional report, so you'll have to read through that, but I will provide you down below with the link to that video, and when the clip starts. Kurt Weldon gave speech after speech, recounting what he saw and what he knew, recounting the FBI and the Clinton administration failures in, for, in information sharing that led to 9-11. Congressman Weldon tried to hold those accountable in the FBI and CIA that he felt mishandled actionable intelligence, which he said could have thwarted the 9-11 terrorists if only top officials at the FBI and others had allowed our rank-and-file law enforcement and military to engage in such a battle. He recounted many examples of how they failed to do so. Understand, I am not a 9-11 denier, nor a big conspiracy advocate. I am simply relaying things for which Congressman Weldon lambasted people at the top of the FBI and other places. In 2006, the Robert Mueller-led FBI took horrendously unjust actions to derail Kurt Weldon's re-election bid just weeks before the vote, actions that were later described as a hit job in this WND article. Each of Weldon's 10 previous re-elections had been by sizable margins, 
Polls showed that he was up by five to seven points in the fall of 2006. Three weeks prior to the election, however, a national story ran about Weldon based upon anonymous sources. Where have we heard that before? That an investigation was underway against him and his daughter, alleging illegal activities involving his congressional work. Weldon had received no prior notification of any such investigation and was dumbfounded that such a story would run, especially since he regularly briefed the FBI and intelligence agencies on his work. A week after the news story broke, alleging a need to act quickly because of the leak, FBI agents from Washington raided the home of Weldon's daughter at 7 a.m. on a Monday morning. Local TV and print media had all been alerted to the raid in advance. Have we seen this before? Oh, yeah. This is starting to look very familiar. And we're already in position to cover the story. Within hours, Democratic protesters were waving caught red-handed signs outside Weldon's district office in Upper Darby. In the ensuing two weeks, local and national media ran multiple stories implying that Weldon, too, must have been under investigation. Given the coverage, Weldon lost the election. To this day, incredibly, no one in authority has talked to Weldon or his daughter about the raid or the investigation. There was no follow-up, no questions, no grand jury interrogation, nothing. One year after the raid, the local FBI office called Weldon's daughter to have her come get the property they had removed from her house, from her home. That was it. The raid ruined the career of Weldon and his daughter. And then there is a link there to that article. Now, something I want to show you real quick right here is this. This is the Wikipedia article on Kurt Weldon. And it has lobbying controversies. In September 2006, the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, a.k.a. CREW, yeah, Media Matters CREW, the one in that document that I've shown you a zillion times, yeah, this was what they were doing. They were targeting people, and this is what Mueller used to get this guy. Released its second annual report on members of Congress with ethics issues, titled Beyond Delay, the 20 most corrupt members of Congress and five to watch. Weldon was one of the 20. And so, but nothing came of it, okay? He was never convicted of anything, but oh, they smeared him just enough for him to lose. He didn't lose by much, actually. He just lost by a little bit. So I think that says a lot, too. Though the WND article blamed the Clintons and Sandy Berger for orchestrating the FBI hit job, we can't lose sight of the fact that the head of the FBI at the time was Robert Mueller. Please understand what former FBI officials have told me. The FBI would never go after a member of Congress, House, or Senate without the full disclosure to and blessing of the FBI director. Even if the idea on how to silence Kurt Weldon did not come from Director Mueller himself, it surely had his blessing and encouragement, though, and, at best, his silence and inaction. The early morning raid by Mueller's FBI, with all the media outside obviously alerted by the FBI, had achieved its goal of colluding to abuse the federal justice system to silence Kurt Weldon by ending his political career. Mueller's FBI worked it like a charm. If the Clintons and Berger manipulated Weldon's re-election to assure his defeat, they did it with the artful aid of Mueller, all while George W. Bush was president. Is any of this sounding familiar? Well, and I think some of us know what George W. Bush did, too. People say those kinds of things just don't happen in America. They certainly seem to when Mueller was in charge of the FBI, and they certainly seem to while he is special counsel as well. It appears clear that President Obama and his Myrmidons knew of Mueller's reputation, that he could be used to take out their political opponents should such extra-legal actions become politically necessary. And I think that's why Obama had him renewed for two more years, because that took him through kind of the election period there in 2012. And I think that's probably why, so he could make sure he was going to be reelected. 
To the great dismay of the many good, decent, and straight-arrow FBI agents, Obama begged Mueller to stay on for two more years than the ten years the law allowed. Obama then asked Congress to approve Mueller's waiver, allowing him to stay on two extra years. Actually, it was a zero. It was a hundred to zero on that vote, so nobody voted against it. Uh. Perhaps the leaders in Congress did not realize what they were doing in approving it. Remember, it was the Senate that voted on that, you know. I did. It was a major mistake, and I said so at the time. This is why I objected strenuously the moment I heard Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein appointed his old friend Bob Mueller to be special counsel to go after President Trump. Okay? So, yeah... I was one of the few who were not surprised when Mueller started selecting his assistants in the special counsel's office who had reputations for being bullies, for indicting people who were not guilty of the charges, for forcing people toward bankruptcy by running up their attorney's fees while the bullies in the special counsel's office enjoy an apparently endless government budget that comes out of our pocket, or by threatening innocent family members with prosecution, which is what they did with General Flynn, so the special counsel's victim would agree to pleading guilty to anything to prevent the Kafka-esque prosecutors from doing more harm to their families. The pattern is there. Are you seeing it? So I'm going to stop at this point, and I will do another video doing some more of this, but... Yeah, these are the kinds of things that we need to be aware of that are in Robert Mueller's past. And by the way, if you watch the video that I included, you know, with Kurt Weldon on there, the rest of it, he talks for about 45 minutes. And the rest of it, he is talking about Able Danger and he's talking about other things that that came up. And there was an officer, Lieutenant Colonel... Anthony Schaefer, who was involved in some stuff. And, you know, you listen to him. He was very impassioned when he was talking about this and he really got caught up in it. And he was kind of dressing down Congress for not doing something about what was going on. And so, yeah, he was not at all happy with the Defense Intelligence Agency and some of the other military leaders and things at the time. So, Anyway, it's an interesting listen to if you want to, but that was in 2005. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to give you on this one. And like I said, I'm going to do another video with more of this because there's a lot more to come and it's stuff I think that you really need to be aware of. And I understand everybody's busy and sometimes it's easier just to put this on while you're doing dishes or you're, you know, doing house chores or whatever. I like to do my crafting while I'm listening to stuff like this. So, so there you go. That way you can kind of kill two birds with one stone with it. Right. And especially if you put it on double speed, it helps because like I said, you can always listen faster than I can read. So if you don't mind me sound a little like a chipmunk, <laughs> but that's what I usually do with a lot of things. So, so that's it for this one. I hope you'll want to hear more because Louie's got a lot more to say here and it needs to be out there so people can see exactly who this Robert Mueller is. So I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later. <laughs>